Welcome to the uh, podcasting panel for uh, PodCamp Pittsburgh this year. Um, I'm Mike Sorg of Sorgatron Media. Um, I'm an avid podcaster for a good while. Um, actually presented at PodCamp Pittsburgh 1. Uh, do Wrestling Mayhem show, of course, uh, which is our longest running one, which we talked about, I think, at PodCamp 1. So, um, and some other things like Awesome Cast, and we work with some clients like uh, Baja SAE, for their podcast and fishing without bait with uh, Namaste Holistic Counseling and some other projects here and there and help some people out with that. And of course, do things around PodCamp and I run around and do video stuff. So I will probably be a little bit of a distracted moderator because I'm making sure the other rooms are still streaming while we're going. So uh, so bear with me for a bit. So I might lean on you guys a little bit here. So, um, so first of all, I figured we'd just go down the line, um, introduce yourself, tell people what you do, one project, multiple projects, whatever the case is. And how long have you been podcasting? Well, I suppose I'll, I'll start. My name is Elsie Escobar. I've been podcasting since July 31st, 2006. Uh, I was uh, the first woman who put a podcast out for a yoga class. That was an audio yoga class. And it's still out there. Um, I'm currently, I work at Lipson. I've been working at Lipson since 2006, so I kind of dove head into podcasting in the, in the space. Um, I started to produce the feed, which is the official Lipson podcast, where we basically talk about podcasting for about 90 minutes. And um, I also run the biggest um, podcasting community. I co-run it. Uh, it is called She Podcast for Women Only, so which has a corresponding podcast as well, again, talking about podcasting from the women's perspective. As of now, we're about to he hit 4,000 women podcasters on our Facebook group, and it's an amazing, amazing community. It's, it's really um, buoyant and fantastic, and my co-host Jessica Kufferman and I are in awe of how big it's gotten in the past couple of years. Hi there. <laughs> ice, ice cream cone, yes. <laughs> My name is Doug Durda. Some of you know me as the Most Reverend Father Spoon. I have a podcast called Should I Drink That? It's a craft beer podcast that's been around since May 5th, 2006. Cinco de Mayo, best way to launch a, a craft beer podcast. Just celebrated our 10th anniversary, and uh, yeah, it's been an interesting ride so far with a uh, podcast, in the, especially in the craft beer world. Uh, one of the longest running craft beer podcasts still around. When we started, there were hundreds of thousands it felt like and there still are today but I think we get new ones every day so longevity has been uh, has been a fun thing for us we're big on uh, Facebook YouTube Twitter the big thing for our show is uh, building a building the community outside of the show uh, when we go to beer fest or even a lot of uh, bars and social gatherings we like to talk to fans and spread the word of craft beer and getting you to drink better things Thank you very yeah, much. Ice cream cone. Ice cream cone. Uh, hi, my name is Will Rutherford. Um, I was a, a member of the Wrestling Mayhem show with Sorg down there uh, since its inception, what, like 11 years ago, 10? Something like that. Many, many long January time ago. January 2006? Right. Yeah. Um, and uh, I kind of splintered off from that to uh, start my own podcast called Panel Riot, which is about comic books. And I'm uh, about two years in, just a little over two years into what has become a really strange art experiment that involves comic books and, and um, uh, conspiracy theories and wine companies and interns that don't actually exist. So, um, so yeah, that's, that's me. Well, and, and it may be slightly podcast related, but you're also a hobo on the side. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. I, I play uh, Sawtooth. Can we curse? It's part, of, it's part of his name. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. So I, I play Sawtooth Willie Birdshit, uh, Pittsburgh's um, eminent underground hobo so <laughs> he got to play with furries a couple weeks ago yes they were they were wonderful very fantastic. welcoming furries so yes um yeah but it's more video than podcast but i will answer questions in the sawtooth voice if you like <laughs> uh yeah oh yeah so um i'm uh i'm dave bracy um i'm a comedian um i'm a stand-up director for the pittsburgh comedy festival um and i also have a podcast uh, called drinking partners um, with a, a fellow comedian, Ed Bailey. Uh, it's a, a craft beer comedy podcast. Um, and uh, we've been doing it for about, it'll be two years next month. 
Um, I still don't really know much about podcasts. Somehow I keep getting put into situations where <laughs> <laughs> like I'm doing more than I know. Like I'm directing this comedy festival and I don't know much about comedy, but it, you know, so uh, yeah, I guess that's, that's who I am and what I do. I, I think that's, that's a for good place to start because I mean, we, of course, you know, Dave was just up here talking about like opportunities and everything. And I can certainly speak to that a lot, but like kind of the first question is like, what's the biggest, craziest surprise since getting into this podcasting thing? And I know you have one there about, uh, I, know, I, know, I know a bunch of you guys do, but I know you, know, you just had one uh, what, last year with the mayor. Uh, yeah, I uh, got to sit in the mayor's office and drink beer, which was kind of dope. Yeah. So opportunities <laughs> take all shapes. <laughs> yeah, I uh, yeah, I, I like I brought a six pack of full pint into the mayor's office, and uh, I walked in and I had a puzzle packs, and um, you know it was like a wooden you know, six pack holder, and uh, she looks at me, she goes, "What kind of root beer is that?" And I was like, uh, "Full pint," and I, I had this crown on. And she was, why are you wearing a crown? And I was like, because I'm the king of my couch. She's like, oh, hey, everybody, he's the king of his couch. <laughs> and, and completely forgot about the six pack of beer that I had on me and like just threw it through the scanner and let me go in or whatever. So that was, <laughs> was kind of dope. Um, but yeah, I mean, I've got to meet a lot of little cool people that I would never get to meet in comedy, you know, stand up. Like I get to talk to a lot of people that I would never talk to or rub shoulders with just from stand-up. I mean, a lot of people don't even know I'm a comedian half the time, so, you know, I mean, that's a that's pretty cool with podcasting. Nice, so just like we were talking about, it kind of like it opens up the doors for yeah, maybe other... Up, I mean, we started the podcast because we wanted to grow our brand outside of, you know, outside yeah. of comedy and kind of ingratiate ourselves with uh, a market, um, again, that wouldn't normally come into a comedy show, especially local comedy. They're like, oh, that, what's that about? But, you know, they hear you on the podcast, you know, they like you, and they're like, all right, I'll spend 10, 15 bucks to go see those guys. And, you know, it's helped out our careers exponentially, so. Awesome. Anybody else? Sure. Um, I think that the biggest surprise, you really have to get in here like an ice cream You cone. do, you do. You got, you got to love the <laughs> yeah. mic. Uh, I, honestly, I think the biggest surprise since, um, since starting podcasting, aside from the fact that people want to listen to us, uh, which is strange, is that people want to give us money for it. Um, by way of, uh, by way of uh, Patreon, we've actually been able to make a little bit of money on the side to cover you know, server fees and hosting and everything like that. Yeah. Um, but aside from that, like you said, the, the people that you meet as a result is incredible. The, the uh, wrestlers that we've met, uh, the people that have reached out to me uh, through love of comic books, it's, uh, it, it's, it's absolutely incredible and it's it's physical proof. People are listening. Is this even on? I can't tell. Yeah, you got, I got you out there. You're out there. People are listening you guys hear all right? on the other side. Doug. All right. Good. All right. Doug. One of the great things I got out of, of podcasting over the last 10 years, uh, well, two things actually. First one is I got a career out of it. I was an IT guy when I started out with podcasting, and now I'm a professional digital marketing media manager guy kind of do everything digital. <laughs> so I run the IT aspect, but I also do a lot of the digital marketing. So I handle Facebook and uh, Twitter ads and Google ads and pretty much all advertising that's done online because I had to start to learn how to market my show. So I taught myself marketing. Uh, the other thing is uh, about halfway through our second or third season, we got an email from uh, a gentleman that was stationed over in Iraq. And he said, hey, I just want to let you guys know that you're getting me through being stationed over here. Wow, somebody over serving, you know, serving for our country right now. It's listening to us, and he said that uh, he's from Pittsburgh originally, and hearing our accents, which is funny because I'm not from Pittsburgh, mm -hmm. but I, I guess I have a Yinzer accent every once in a while. He said hearing your accents and hearing the stories you guys are talking about really helps me get through being stationed over here. And then when he came back, we got to meet him. Ends up that he's a home brewer, and now he's a really good friend of ours. So it was hearing a story like that really opened my eyes to how far podcasting can reach. I mean, we're, we're helping our troops. I never thought a beer drinking show out of Pittsburgh would ever do anything like that. Plus, I get free beer. That's, an, that's also a nice perk. Um, I agree with all the stuff that they've said. Um, I've had the experience of everything that they've said, including I have had people um, that have been overseas stationed as well who have been doing my podcast, and they've reached out to me, said that they've been doing yoga classes 
with me uh, in all kinds all over the world, which has been pretty amazing. Um, but I want to kind of talk about it, uh, podcasting and its impact, not necessarily just for me as, a, um, I guess, a professional, but also as a woman, because podcasting doesn't really necessarily have any doors that you don't have a key to, um, and you can basically do anything that you want. And when I started podcasting, I didn't necessarily do it because I wanted to reach anybody. I did it because I wanted to be heard. And I felt getting behind the microphone and putting my voice out there, regardless of if anybody ever listened to what I had to say, was empowering enough to give me the courage to continue to speak, to continue to express myself, and to have that kind of an impact on the world around me and myself as a woman in the world to know that I do have a voice. So it was just empowering sort of like as in a self self-empowering uh, place, right? And of course, all the stuff that they've talked about as well, because it's been, I mean, uh, I've, I've been working in podcasting since 2007. That's all I do all day long, is I talk podcasting, I teach podcasting, I'm fired up about podcasting, I record constantly, I'm constantly editing, so who does that and get paid for it? That's like out of control, so. <laughs> well, I think that's good to get into, because I mean, the landscape is, way different than, you know, what we saw, you know, 11 years ago at PodCamp 1, right? Um, and even, like, seeing that, you know, I've seen just looking at the session seat, sheet and seeing podcasts and so many titles and saying, well, I guess I don't have to do much this year. Um, you know, and it's like, oh, I guess we'll do a panel. Uh, but, uh, you know, like, seeing that kind of dip and, and come back in interest and in a big way with, you know, our, you know, the serials and everything like that. Um, I know the discussion last week was like, oh, did you know podcasting was dead for a bit? You know, because I didn't know. We've been doing this the whole time, right? Um, how do you feel like kind of that state of it is now as we are kind of looking at these, these big companies are still kind of diving into it and, and getting their edge into it while there's like, you know, little guys like us that are still kind of building our, our little, you know, mini empires. So is, is the question, how do we feel about the big guys coming into our turf? Yeah. I mean, All right. <laughs> like, I'm just, I'm just, okay, let me, let me frame okay. that a little bit more. The thing that I always say is, well, listen, I can't compete with Kevin Smith because he brings a giant audience with it. A little bit of the don't sweat the stats kind of thing, right? I'm like, I'm not going to be able to roll right in like he does because he's made mall rats and you know gets to do his thing. Um, he's just smart enough to take a... Uh, different format and and do you know and do what he wants with it and take that clout with him uh, and we're kind of building from ground zero and up from there um, and kind of um, you know how do you kind of look at those are you threatened by those bigger ones or do you see more of a help for, towards what you're trying to do on your level I see two different uh, things right now is that there's a lot of professionals that are coming into the space. And when I say professionals, I mean people who have gone to broadcasting school and have studied journalism and are um, aware of editing and aware of storytelling and stitching things together. And this is what they've done when they've gone to school. They're, they're, they want to get a job doing you know, audio engineering and teaching, or not even teaching, but creating audio. Um, whereas I feel a lot of us indie podcasters have gotten into it because we have something very specific to say. So we are really focused on the thing that we want to talk about. I don't necessarily want to go and get a job editing something for public radio. I, I'm not interested in creating um, the next serial myself because that's not my cup of tea. I'm not, I'm not a journalist, but I do have things to say. And, but I'd rather work on my own stuff. So I'm not, I don't consider myself a professional journalist. So I think that that's a totally different um, area, right, um, that we see. What it does kind of irk me a little bit is that those professionals are the ones that are getting the press. And I feel that the indie podcasters, the us that are here, are not getting the press that we deserve because people don't know we exist, because public radio has larger voices. And I think that that's really up to us to educate the current journalism, journalistic people out there or the digital media to know that we do exist and this is what we do. And podcasting is a lot bigger than NPR, WNYC, and all of those cats. 
because we do have a bigger impact, I feel, in the general population than they do. There's a lot of similarities between podcasting and bloggers, too. Uh, a few years ago, you know, five, six years ago, people didn't take bloggers seriously. And then I think the newspapers and more of the mass media realized that they were losing audiences to bloggers because they could express what they wanted to do. So now all the newspapers have blogs. We're seeing the same thing with podcasting where we started out podcasting because we loved it. We had, like Elsie said, we, we had something we wanted to say and there was no restrictions on us. There still isn't. I can say anything I want and, and be done with it. I don't have to answer to anybody except for myself. I've ticked off some listeners before. That's fine. They've come back and they've told me what they didn't like, what they do like. That's great feedback. But if I answer to somebody, then I got to deal with investors, you got to deal with bosses. And that, so there's that difference between the indies and like the NPRs that are out there. But it helps having NPR and iHeartRadio and all these other guys having podcasts because it gives a little bit of a legitimacy to what we're doing because they're now taking it serious. The mainstream media is taking it serious. So it's not just like, oh, it's a little hobby you're doing. You're doing the same thing the big guys are doing. So it's... And also they, they, they represent opportunities too, like our, yes. our radio. We have our podcast on iHeartRadio. A guy calls me like every week and says, hey, can't wait to listen to you Wednesday on iHeart, right? And I, and I made, kind of made the joke when we first went on there. I was like, hey, Mikey and Bob, we're coming for you because we're in the same place you are. You know? And it really is. You are, you are seriously as accessible and on the level as what they're doing, and, and we can say the F word and they can't, I guess. We can say it a lot. <laughs> we, we pride ourselves on that back in the day. But, um, um, I think that, uh, so if you compare the larger, more popular podcasts to um, like Walmart or Target or something like that, that doesn't mean that there shouldn't be mom and pop stores and indie podcasts. And in fact, I think that we benefit from that contrast because, like was mentioned, um, they operate under certain restrictions that uh, make what they're putting out there in some cases a little better, but in most cases, you know, not as great. I mean, they're wildly successful podcasts who have, you know, backers that are almost unlistenable, you know what I mean? But they're popular because they're, they're big names and they have backers and everything like that. So. Um, but uh, back to your original question. What was your original question? <laughs> I think I've lost the thread. That's fine. That's fine. It's it's kind of changed as we go. Just kind of like that the comparison, the opportunities. The you know, are we scared of the big guys of, of, that are in our way? Uh, um, well, Not there's a, way, there's a saying I like to use, and I think I actually used it on this panel last year too. Was a, a flood raises all ships, and uh, that is that the. the the big podcasts bring attention to podcasting and more uh, more ears and more voices to it as well. So um, I think that we benefit from their press, but I do agree that um, we should have a little more press of our own as well. <laughs> Certainly. And now, so. Dave, you're, you're doing, you're, you're a comedian, so I mean, comedy podcasts are huge right now. Um. Yeah, comedy. <laughs> like, I, I mean, I mean, I, I mean, it, it seems like look. Okay, look. As an outsider looking at that, it's just like, okay, you're a comedian. You do a podcast. It's kind of like like the thing yeah, you do what, now. Yeah, right? that's, I mean, everybody, every comedian has a podcast. Like, you know, podcasts are all over the place. Like, I sometimes I don't even tell people I have a podcast because they're like, oh yeah, everybody has a podcast. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> so, you know, like I just put it on my card and like I did it reluctantly because, you know, I, like I don't know, for so, like for me, like and I, this, I might be like, you know, you know, in a den of wolves right now, but like I did, like I did, like I, I was just kind of like, like, oh yeah, I got a podcast. Like and I'll say it like, oh, I got a podcast, you know, don't worry, you know, because it, like it is, it's, 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 it's flooded as hell. And then you have the bigger names come in and like, you know, they just see you as like some upstart or whatever. Um, I think the success that I've, I've been able to, I mean, we've been able to have is, uh, you know, we started out with Epicast and, you know, uh, you know, quality was first and foremost. So, you know, the audio quality and we were going to, like, we didn't know anything about podcasts. We just got in, we were like, oh, we just, we were just going to talk into like a mic on a, you know, connected to a computer. It was going to be terrible. It was absolutely going to be terrible. But we hooked up with Epicast and like, you know, the quality of it came out first. Um, and then, you know, I think that being comedians and, and, and having uh, comedy and, and beer and, and focusing on, um, 
you know, accentuating the cool things that are going on in Pittsburgh, uh, we grow our audience and it's a very organic growth through that, you know, that medium. So you can come see us do comedy, you know, on stage and then you can come see us do live shows and then you can hear us on, you know, so we're like, you know, like we're sitting with Rick Seaback and, and John Fetterman, you know what I mean? Like, so it's, I think that the, th I think that it really is just a, a I don't know, again, again it's, it's an organic growth and like you, we're selling ourselves Mm -hmm. And I think that's the thing about podcasts, and I think that's the thing everybody here and everybody I know, like, you know, you can, you can take a format, you know, you can take, you know, jokes, and you can take these things, but you can't, you can't take me, and you can't take, you know, who we are, and I think that that is the, the success that we've had, um, despite, you know, the flood and, and, and with, you know, bigger names coming in, is that, um, you know, we're, we're, we're original in some regard, we're still trying to figure that out, I mean, we haven't even hit a hundred episodes yet, so we're still trying to figure out who we are and why people are listening to us. But you know, I mean, the, the, I guess the one thing is just you know, keep, like she said, keep recording and keep putting out quality content, quality first, and not trying to you know, you know, fall into gimmicks and you know, whatever. And hopefully, you know, you'll you'll rise. The, you know, the wheat and the chaff and the whole that. It's also nice because you're you know, come from comedy. You're already a performer. You're comfortable in front of a microphone, in front of a room of people, instead of just you know. Yeah, digital I mean, it's, people it's, right it's, it's it's different like i mean i started out with youtube videos and i did that shortly and then the transition from youtube videos to on stage was completely different yeah. as well as you know going on stage to podcasting like there's there's elements that you know through all three of them through any you know media anytime you're on stage or you're trying to you know perform or whatever but you know it's completely different i mean like we didn't you know i listen to myself i hate listening to myself i hate my voice like i did a lot of ums and ahs and 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 conversations that went nowhere so i mean it was there's a lot of there's definitely a learning curve to it but i think that you know you if you have that confidence the same thing with the youtube videos going on stage i had that i knew that i was funny i just had to figure out how to be funny in this format and then with podcasting you know, it's how to be funny in this format. And it's easier in some ways because I don't have to keep you laughing every 30 seconds, but at the same time, I need to keep you your attention for an hour to an hour and a half. So, you know, it's kind of like, you know, figuring that out. Um, speaking of like kind of that adaption, ad adaptation, uh, Will, I know you, you know, we did Wrestling Mayhem Show, which was really just like the two of us yelling into the PC mics and just they're really, really horrible back in the day. But somehow people started listening to it. Uh, you went from that to your current project, which is like a very, I like to think of it as kind of a one man show with Panel Riot. You know, there are other characters, but, you know, it's a one man show. Right. Yeah, yeah, that's true. And it, it was uh, it was an adjustment to to go from having, you know, one other person to work off of to two to three. And I think that we had like eight at max. Yeah. Just yeah, a crazy we amount try not of people to do working anymore. off of, um, working, all bouncing things off of each other to, um, to just me. It's just me and a microphone and, and the editing process to make it not sound terrible. And your cat. Oh, and the cat. Yeah. 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 <laughs> which is a whole different editing process because he doesn't cooperate. <laughs> he meows when he wants. <laughs> I imagine the meows that end up in the show are probably the hardest part to capture. Uh, he's, he, he can be predictable sometimes when he's hungry <laughs> <laughs> and just kind of put the microphone in his face. But, uh, but yeah, it's, it is a whole different animal because before, on top of that, you handled all the production. So uh, every Tuesday night I sat down and I got into a chat room and then I talked for two hours and that was the end of it. You know, but now I sit in my chair and I talk for an hour to two hours and then edit it down so it's a length that I'm comfortable with. And then I, uh, you know, enhance all the audio, take out all the ums and pauses and, and the stuff that I don't like anymore. And then, um, you know, fix all the metadata, put out the MP3, release it, promote it. It's, it, it really is a whole different animal. Kind of go from that because um, I, think, I think some of us have, probably have some pretty interesting um, community kind of aspects. And, and it's different, you know, from, you know, you're doing yoga, you know, kind of podcast too, because yeah, I'm seeing that, you know, from, you know, from the different things that I've, I've worked with with healthcare and everything. Um, where are you finding today, because this has obviously changed. I mean, we started on MySpace um, and, and we were very good on MySpace. There's still a lot of very interesting pictures up there. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, where are you seeing your podcast kind of getting the most interaction, whether it be like a Facebook, Twitter, some kind of weird user group that you found or something like that. Because I know you all represent very different, uh, for the most part, uh, communities that are kind of existing outside of podcasting too. 
So um, comic book fans are a very passionate bunch. And uh, we do have a Facebook group, and there are two guys specifically uh, who argue every single week. And they don't argue about things I say on the show, they argue about the TV show Arrow. <laughs> <laughs> one likes a character on Arrow, and the other one does not, and they love yelling at each other. But as a result, that draws people into that conversation, <laughs> and these two guys just bickering with each other uh, draws an audience into the Facebook group. And it's, it, it's the, the strangest thing. I, I have no explanation for it. I arguably just kinda... the sweetest character on the show, too. What's that? Arguably the sweetest character on the show. Too. Yes. Yeah. So. Abs- I don't know. I don't watch. <laughs> <laughs> Surprisingly, I found a lot of beer fans on Google+. I think we're the only people on Google+. Plus. <laughs> but it... But it's been a great haven for us because a lot the, – the biggest issue we had with craft beer over the last few years is the pretentiousness of the beer snobs. That was the biggest thing that turned off a lot of people, like the everyday Joe, getting into craft beer. So people would want to try it out, and then the snobs would be like, why are you drinking that? Oh, you don't get the fruity aroma. Well, you know what? You see someone doing that in a bar, probably slap the beer out of their hand because they're being a jagoff. The cool thing with Google Plus is we had a place to go finally to talk about beer, and no one cared what your views were as long as you were cool with everyone. You like a beer? Great. You don't like a beer? Fantastic. Why don't you? And we'd have really great conversations. All this stemmed because there were only two or three craft beer websites out there or forums where people could go talk. And then Google Plus came around and realized, hey, there's nobody else here but us. Let's, uh, let's see what we can do with this. So I found a ton of people on Google+, Plus, which I like to think are barbecue and beer people, my people. So I hang out there a lot. Uh, also on Facebook, we had to start a group because of how Facebook was scaling back the reach of Facebook pages. Thanks a lot, Facebook. Uh, if I wanted to pay, then I'd be able to have more people show up. So I started a group, which I had a long time ago, got rid of that because pages were becoming big. So then we went, switched back to the group and told everyone, hey, if you just add us for get notified first, you'll, you know, you'll get all of our news. And that took off for us. Every time I make a post, there's the same three or four people that, like, like with you, start fights. And because they're bickering about one person likes one thing, another person doesn't like it. And I, I really think that they just don't like each other and are looking for a reason to fight on Facebook. <laughs> but they keep it civil. And that's the cool thing is no one gets out of hand about it. But there's so many different types of people, different tastes, you know, different religions, everything. It's a big mix of people getting on there to talk about beer, and no one's getting out of hand with it, and which is why I really like the Facebook crowd that we have. Unlike the forums where people just kind of – I think Will actually said this to me once. Uh, your fans have diarrhea of the mouth <laughs> because all they did was just spew just garbage out there. It was in one of the pod camps that came up. And, and that's why I, I love Facebook is because people are, are – there's a spot on Facebook where people are civil, <laughs> which is amazing to think about. And uh, it's surprising. It's with beer drinkers, and it's – you know we happen to find the, the niche that people can come here and relax and just talk about things. So it's – Facebook's been huge. Twitter, I, I don't know. I'm still trying to figure out why people are, are complaining on Twitter because your, your feed scrolls so fast. No one really sees it. I think it's more for your own venting purposes. But it's great to let people know, like, if I'm live tweeting of a beer fest or want to get news out fast, it's out, I'll definitely go with Twitter on that. I don't know where people find us or how they listen to it. Like, I honestly, like, I honestly, I show up and I, and I talk for, like, an hour and a half with some cool people. I get shit-faced while I do it, and then I leave. Epicast, like, edits it. They put it out there. I don't know what the, no, I couldn't tell you how many downloads we have, like, um, I like with the comedy thing. It's weird because we we get some listeners from craft. You know, we do our live shows at, at brewery, so we get some of that. Um, I, I have a, I'm big on Twitter. Like I do a lot of tweeting or whatever. But like to be honest, I would say maybe 10 percent of my followers listen to the podcast. Like I'm constantly trying to pump it to them. Like hey, you know, like listen to my podcast. But Twitter is for short attention spans, and podcast is for the opposite. So you know, it's hard to get people to like you know come on there or whatever. Uh, Facebook is another thing, but you know we use that for promoting our you know comedy shows or whatever. So like, 
I mean, the podcast seems to be going well, and like every once in a while, like somebody will come up to me and be like, "Hey, you know, I, I've heard of you, or I, you know, I've listened to your podcast." But like when I'm podcasting, like I kind of talk as if nobody's listening because I don't really know if anybody's listening or not. It's so weird. It's such a one way, and and I think it helps because, you know, we have Epicast and they tell us how to podcast. Um, they'll give us points and whatnot. But like when we're in there, we're just having a conversation. We're not worried about the numbers. We're not worried about you know who's listening, what the audience is. And I think that as a result, we have this, you know, kind of freeing, organic, like, you know, like Doug was saying, we can say whatever we want. Like, we don't have anybody to answer to. So, like, you know, people come on, they're like, oh, what can I say? Like, whatever the fuck you want. Like, I mean, it's a podcast, it's the internet. Like, whatever. Like, you're, you're in a free space and we're feeding you beer while you're doing it. Like, yeah. this is the most open place you could possibly be. And I think a lot of people have come up to us and said, like, you know, you, your interview is a little different because you don't usually get to hear this person drunk. You know, like with a bunch of comedians. You know what I mean, like, so, you know, I don't know where our, our listeners come from. And, like, I, and, and then a lot of times, you know, we'll, we'll get into these, you know, live shows and they'll come up to you and they're like, oh, that was really great. You know, can't li wait to listen to your podcast. And, and they don't listen. They'll never get, we're never going to see them again. They're not going to come to another comedy show. Like, they don't even remember our names at the end of it. I pass them three or four cards. And, like, I have, I have no idea. You know, I honestly have no idea where they come from. I just, I'm just glad that somebody's listening from what Epic has is telling us. I will say you guys have the most comfy couch. I, I got to drink with these guys a few weeks ago. You yeah. guys have probably the best atmosphere <laughs> for any interview I've ever been, been a I, part I, of. It's it's very cool there. If you guys I envy that chance. couch. Like I honestly like I've been I've been I've been fortunate enough to be on that couch twice because does this whole cut up came in and Marta on the move came in and like they interviewed us on the couch and like I envy our guests all the time like because it's so. It's like one of those oversized couches that kind of like it hugs you and you're in there and it's like ah and I'm just sitting there and it's with my lean it's ah yeah. I, yeah I'm all, I also believe in my studio of having the uh, the the secret of the comfy comfy couch because uh, yeah, and it, couch. yeah yeah <laughs> this big purple love seat couch thing that's completely coming with me to the next studio um, but uh, uh, and that's uh, for those wondering that's that, that's out of uh, work hard Pittsburgh actually up in Allentown in which there's a lot of great stuff coming out there including Epic Caspian based so. Uh, who also provide our live stream here in the big room. So, um, uh, The community that was built around She Podcast, interestingly enough, it built out from a Facebook group. Uh, my uh, co-host and partner, Jessica Kupferman, she created a group. I think it was called Women in Podcasting or Women Who Podcast or something like that. And, you know, I've been wanting to do something like that for so many years, and I just never did. It's just one of those things where you're just like, oh, I don't want to go make up a Facebook group. Who does that? And then she did it, and I was like, oh! And since I had, I had so many women podcasters that I knew, I immediately started to, like, add a gazillion, bajillion different women podcasters to the group. And then they started coming in, and in the conversation, people were like, you know, we should ha there should be a podcast about women in podcasting. And then Jess and I, we, we basically got together and she said, do you want to do it? Okay, let's do it. Let's do it. And within a week, we had a podcast, we had a website, we had like things, we had a microphone, we had a horrible audio. Even though we've been podcasting for a while, because we, you know, there's one thing, we don't have a professional space or anything like that. We have kids, you know, people yelling and screaming. So we just started. We just started. And so our group started before the podcast did. The podcast followed that. And then the podcast itself has a life on its own. The main hub of the community is a woman's only group uh, on Facebook, where there are probably, I would say, half of the women in there don't know about the She Podcast, the podcast, because people come in just as women who want to podcast. They get to know us there. We also have a lot of, of pretty big male audience that we didn't know we had, because we don't speak to guys really we just speak about our experience but they've been really really vocal to us primarily on Twitter so they will have communications um, I actually had um, John C. Dvorak <laughs> I don't know if you guys know him he listens to our podcast which is really weird and um, he emailed us and he said how come let, I just have one piece of um, advice for you guys and he, he, he basically said how come you're using a closed space to have your community which was Facebook and if you guys know No Agenda and Adam Curry and John C. Dvorak you know that they're constantly sort of like you know, they, they don't like closed settings and keeping things like 
not open. And, and I said, and then it made me doubt. I was like, maybe we should open it up. But really, we did it because we wanted to provide a, a safe place for women to be in and be able to communicate. And we basically asked our ladies, and all of them went, no! And so we weren't like, okay, we're not going to do it. We just asked. And, and we kind of decided, you know what, if guys want to be part of us, uh, of, of our community, you guys can totally engage with us on Twitter. But this little area here, this is just for women only, and we just kind of hang out there and feel comfortable being there. Um, and it, but it was really intriguing how many men are kind of closet she podcasters, <laughs> which is like kind of crazy, but exciting. I have to confess to uh, attending one of your webinars. Okay. Uh, fantastic <laughs> one about your uh, sponsor packet. Okay. I highly recommend. Uh, so yeah, I dropped in on that one. Okay. So you know. So closet. Yes, yes, I am a closet sheep podcaster, <laughs> at least through that. So, um, I don't know where I was going to go from there. <laughs> well, actually, I think that's an interesting thing, because, I mean, a lot of times, you know, with a discussion, I mean, Chris Brogan was up here and saying, yeah, what pocket, you know, what, what microphone do I need? He's like, it doesn't matter. Get one and talk to it, you know, and start the thing. Um, and there's been some great articles about, you know, women podcasting, you know, here in Pittsburgh. Um, is... I think that's a good question, and, and I'm realizing I don't think we've had a lot of women on this panel from, from year to year. So, so welcome. Uh, <laughs> is it different to say, you know, for a woman to get into podcasting, especially with everything crazy going on, like the Gamergate and all this kind of scary stuff happening there, is it different to just, no, just begin a microphone, get going for, for, for somebody? Or female. Uh, uh, sometimes it is, and I think that that's what we saw, or we see a lot of the, the biggest obstacles is the tech. And for mm. the most part, um, w what we have observed, and I, you know, it is the, the speaking up of women in, in like regular podcasting groups to ask a, a question about technical stuff, because sometimes we get overwhelmed with the responses. Like, we'll get really technical responses, and then we'll kind of go like, thanks, that was great. What the hell does that mean? You know, there's like all of this information and it feels um, a little bit daunting sometimes to ask the super, super basic questions about tech. Now that's not obviously everybody. Um, there's a lot of obviously very techy women that are also in the space that can absolutely hold their own. But the majority of, of women are really adept in the conversation, in the communication, in the creating community, in the being able to understand who their audience is, in, in their passion and all that stuff. And they get caught up with the, how do I get this little audio to connect with my website? And what's this RSS thing? And how do I get it into iTunes? You know, so it's, it's the whole how it, everything gets together. It's not necessarily that we couldn't figure it out. It's that we don't understand the basic ecosystem of how these things work. Mm -hmm. And it seems in a generalized way that a lot of, of men are a little bit more adept in working some of these uh, or maybe even just recognizing the vocabulary around it. It's just basic you know, information. Um, but then once that happens, the ladies just take off. I mean, it's kind of crazy. And so part of it also is the, the fact that we aren't uh, heard as much in the same way that we were talking about indie podcasters. We are there. Uh, there's a plenty of women podcasters. It's just that oftentimes um, there are louder voices in this space. By the way, I think we've because uh, I, I hadn't heard the term indie podcaster because I felt like podcasting was was so indie in right. concept to begin with, right? I love like it. ten years ago. What's that? <laughs> That's fantastic. Yeah, <laughs> That's a great term. Yeah, like like indie, but it's always been in, indie, and now now I guess it's not, right? But with all these guys coming in, well, uh, we've called them now. The other guys, the procasters, is sort of what we are pro calling them. We're calling yeah. them procasters because they're <laughs> we're the indies, and then there's the procasters. And then how do you know you're a procaster? That means if you have a team, you have a lot of money, you have like, you know, a gazillion people working for you and you have a, you know, a budget to create, you know, yeah. 10 episodes, yeah. that's, you mean that's a bro procaster. You're a procaster. Yeah, between that and the, the closeted she podcasters is yeah. now on Twitter too. So that's official. So. Um, from there, I actually, uh, we're, we're heading to the end of the time. I wanted to give an opportunity if anybody had any questions for the panel. Can 
Who wants to go first? I know. I think that you know it's a viable it's a viable goal to just be famous. Cause <laughs> just because you know, there's a lot of people who are like, well, I want to like build my business based on the consulting thing. I wanted to, like, for me, I just want a podcast. That's it. If I can keep on podcasting for the rest of my life, I'd be really happy. So it, it and being paid for it is obviously bonus. And now I do have an opportunity to work with people in terms of podcast development. So I'm not a one-on-one teacher. I really don't like to do that. But there's a lot of people who really, that I do truly believe in like getting their voices out there. But if I can in some way podcast and have a show for the rest of my life, when I'm like 80 or 90 years old behind the mic, like that to me is awesome. So I personally really, really identify with being a podcaster, period. <laughs> if I could have a beer podcast at 80, that would be so cool. Actually, if I could still be in front of a microphone on 80, that would be cool. Um, my goal when I first started the show was to help educate people about craft beer. I'm very passionate about it. And when someone comes up to me and, and says, I've tried something new, and it, it's not even about, a lot of people think beer drinking is just about getting loaded with your friends and whatever. There's a lot to it with how the beer is made, uh, you know, the, the hard work that goes into it, the dedication from the brewers, the creativity that goes into it. It's like cooking. It's like anything else that you can create. And if I can get someone to expand their horizons, get past the whole marketing BS that they've had for the last 40, 50, 60 years, I, it's, I, that, that's a huge goal for me. And I've, I've heard it from people. Now, going forward, if I could do this for a living, that would be fantastic. If I could go past doing this from my dining room table while my kids come running into the room screaming, going, oh my God, daddy's got his headphones on again, and then they want to talk, that would be great too. I'd love to have a dedicated studio space. But if I could uh, do this for a living along with uh, my social media work, because I'm very passionate about digital media and digital marketing, I love it. I love building communities. I like seeing people happy, and that's part of why I do this. People come up to me and say, I like listening to your stories, I like what you have to say, and that, that makes me feel good inside. Oh, I didn't know if you want to use that. Fine. All right. Um, well, I, I, I'll level with you. Um, I don't know. Uh, I, when I came on this panel, uh, uh, when when Sorga asked me, I thought, what what the hell am I going to say? I've been podcasting for so long, and um, I I really feel like I've lost the thread of it. You know, I don't. I I, I kind of lost sight of why I started doing it originally. What it was about podcasting that I loved and what I was getting back from it. But to that end, being on this panel and being here and, and hearing uh, what what everyone up here is saying has reminded me of, of all of those things, why I started doing it in the first place, building communities and sharing things that I love with other people and and creating, creating. Just the feeling of making something from nothing is uh, incredible. And that's, I think that was, that was really well put. So, um, so honestly, um, my goal is to go home and make my podcast. And that's really all that I have right now, <laughs> is to just find out whatever happens next with it. So. Until you're 80? Sure, yeah. Well, I, I'm not busy. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> I want the money. <laughs> Give me the money. I um no, I mean we sold out eight shows downtown since starting this podcast. Nice. Um, you know, a lot of a lot of people it, it it's a lot of traffic. Um I uh you know, with comedy the whole nine, like I mean I got into comedy because I, I wanted money. Like I'm I'm an uh, I consider myself an artist or whatever, but like really I like to to, to get shit faced and throw parties and have fun. And I've been doing that most of my life. And at some point, somebody was like, well, you got to do something. You got to settle down on something. And I've made a way to do that. I just started it with comedy. And I, I found a way to make money through comedy. And I got into podcasts because I felt like that was a way to expand my comedy to make more money. And uh, I eventually want to open up a venue because I like money and throwing parties. And that's going to be the you know end result. So within the next five years, I'm going to be opening up a venue um, somewhere in Pittsburgh, and I would like that the podcast, you know, also bring people to my venue as well as my comedy to bring people into my venue. Like, 
Um, so, you know, that's where I want to, you know, and if I can continue to podcast through there, like I would like to start making money actually podcasting. That's the thing that we haven't been able to do yet. The the thing that makes it worth showing up is that, you know, we do actually make money uh, indirectly from it, you know, uh, through ticket sales and promotion and things of that nature. But to actually come into a studio and get paid for my time in the studio, that's a goal. I would love to do that. Um, if it opens up to some sort of, you know, greater broadcasting, you know, like, you know, uh, opportunities and I take that route, then that's awesome. I'll do that as well. Um, but at the end of the day, I, uh, I want to quit my day job and I want to do something that I enjoy doing um, all day long. And, uh, you know, whether that be a you know, venue or a podcast or whatever, I just, I, I, want, to, I want money. Well, that's my end goal. And I don't even know if I'm gonna be alive when I'm 80. I mean, I drink a lot of beer and, and, and eat a lot of meat. So, I mean, I might only live until I'm 50. I mean, I got a 50 year plan, you know, so that's, you know. If I'm here at, at 80, that's dope. I gotta say, for me, like, it's, you know, obviously I've kind of turned this into kind of a business between the video production and podcast production and everything, but, and I have a lot of kind of big plans and goals just to make things bigger and cooler and, and really kind of, you know, do my part to put Pittsburgh on the map. But even if, like, everything falls out and, and everything, I know in the long run I will still be there on Tuesday evening talking about pro wrestling with my friends and talking about technology and gadgets with my other friends, uh, and talking about Pittsburgh and being awesome, uh, and talking about awesome things on Awesome Cast. Um, so the goal is to continue the conversations, and if not, make them bigger for me. So um, I think that's going to wrap it for us. Real quick, uh, tell people where they can find you. We'll go down the line, and then think that'll be it. Of course, I'm on SorgatronMedia.com. Everything is linked off there for me, and you can find old episodes of, of uh, uh, Will down there uh, pretending to be a monkey uh, and, 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 and a manager from, from McDonald's uh, back in the day. So, Oh, oh uh, you can find... Uh me over at ShePodcasts.com, as well as on Libsyn. Libsyn's the feed. If you go into iTunes and you search for L-I-B-S-Y-N, the feed is a, both of those podcasts are all about podcasting. One of them is very hardcore, and the other one is more from the women's perspective, two completely different flavors. Um, and uh, you can find me on social media almost anywhere if you follow Yogeek, Y-O-G-E-E-K. You can find me at shouldidrinkthat.com on Twitter, Periscope, at SIDT, and Facebook and everything else, slash shouldidrinkthat. Also, I have a barbecue project that I started called yinslovebbq.com. We're going to start to have a crossover between beer and barbecue, which, quite frankly, if I can get free beer and free barbecue, this is going to be the best life ever. <laughs> so that's my other goal. <laughs> at SIDT. And then if you want to follow me personally, it's at Douglas Durda, D-O-U-G-L-A-S-D-E-R-D-A. -E is your goal to get fat from podcasting? <laughs> you know what? I had to get a gym membership <laughs> so I wouldn't keel over while I'm recording a show, but I think I'm looking quite svelte since the earlier days. Oh, yeah, <laughs> certainly, certainly. Um, you can find me at panelriot.com. That's the uh, home of the podcast, and also the name of the Twitter is at panelriot. Uh, I'm at DJ Lunchbox on Twitter. Uh, you can also follow our invisible, non existent intern, Stan, at intern Stan. Uh, also, if you search for Sawtooth Willie, W I L L I E, you can see me covered in dirt, missing a tooth, and uh, talking about tearing pigeons in half. Um, would I usually have a rundown here? Uh, Drinking Partners. Uh, my name is Dave Bracey, and uh, we are Drinking Partners. And if you're looking for us, you can find us on epicastnetwork.com slash partnerspot. You can find us on iTunes, Stitcher, Lipson, and Google Play under Drinking Partners. And you can find us on Facebook, IG, and Twitter at Partnerspot. Um, and if you're looking for me personally, I'm Dave Bracey, D-A-Y-B-R-A-C-E-Y, -E everywhere. YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, IG, your mom's house, wherever you're My looking space. for me. <laughs>
you love how you went into outro mode there. Um, and so please subscribe to all their podcasts. If you meet anybody else that's just started or has been doing a podcast, go check that out. Just just even just take a peek at anybody that, that you meet this weekend uh, and check it out and uh, share it, whatever the case may be. Start it on wherever you find it on. Give a rating or something. That means a lot to anybody that's podcasting, whether it's been a week or 10 years. So uh, thank you so much, everybody.